Good morning, church. Thank you for joining us early. Uh, before church, we like to pray and welcome God's presence into church. And we also want to feel His presence this morning. So let's uh, come with expectant hearts ready to receive. And can I invite you to stand and to raise your hands as we pray. Yeah. Thank you, God, for today. Thank you for everything that you've done for us so far. Thank you for pouring out your blessings upon our lives. Thank you for the people that have stepped up to serve this morning, O Lord. We pray that you grant them your peace of mind, grant them your ability to shine, O Lord, grant them the ability to focus on you and everything that they do. We also pray that the congregation today will come to you with expectant hearts ready to receive. We thank you for your word that you've given to Rachel. And we also pray that you will be able to uh, manifest in this place, O Lord. We pray that each and every house that we're watching from will be filled with your presence. We pray that your, your Holy Spirit will fill us afresh. We pray that you will uh, allow us to be in good health, allow us to enjoy our week ahead a lot. And also we pray that uh, each and every person that's going through something right now will find peace in you, will be able to lean on your understanding or not their own a lot. We will be able also to rest in your presence a lot. And if they need confidence, they'll find it in you. If they need healing, they'll find it in you a lot. And if they need to be uh, to study well and to absorb all the knowledge, they'll be able to do it a lot. And they'll be able to articulate well, be able to put into the exams a lot. And we pray for a winning service this morning. We pray for at least one salvation a lot. We pray that we are here to save the lost a lot. And we pray that you'll send them to us a lot. And we pray that this service will be a blessing to someone this morning a lot. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. X is part of a global church community and we have churches all over the world in Melbourne, in Malaysia and, and elsewhere as well. Uh, we want to pray for each and every church plant as they have prayed for us. Let's stand in the gap and intercede for them as well. So you can see all the church plants on the screen now. Please choose one to pray for and then I'll end us in prayer. Yeah. Thank you God for today and thank you for allowing us to be part of a bigger uh, network of churches that is global and is reaching every part of the world a lot. We pray that you will be with us. We pray that you will grant us our unity a lot. We pray that you will continue to pour out your blessing and your direction into the leadership of this church. We pray that we will continue to prosper. We will be able to spread hope in this time of crisis a lot. And we will be able to lean on you when we need help. And we will be able to also reap the harvest that we have prepared for a lot. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hi Church, so good to see all of you here this morning. You know the Word of God says to enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. And that's what we want to do this morning, amen? We want to give God the best praise that we can give Him because He is worthy of it all, amen? So why not stand on your feet and in the count of three, let's give God a shout of praise and a clap offering, amen? One, two, three. Jesus, oh, hallelujah,
to name Nothing shall be impossible Your kingdom reigns unstoppable We'll shout your praise forevermore Jesus our God unstoppable Nothing shall be impossible Your kingdom reigns unstoppable We'll shout your praise forevermore
enemy meant for me oh, And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for me oh, And you turn it for good You turn it for good What the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. That's right, you turn it for good. I 
see his hooves, his hands, his feet, my Savior, that kiss Oh 
Yong for leading us in the amazing time of worship. Hi Church, my name is Wingman and I'm your chairperson today. If this is your first time here at X Church, we would love to give you a very warm welcome. So do drop a hi or wave down in the chat and when we can meet in person, whether you are in London, Bristol or Edinburgh, you know, do come by so that we can welcome you in person. Now, moving on to the time of tithes and offerings. This is an exciting time for us as we can continue in our worship by giving God our best. There are two ways for you to give today. Um, one of them is through bank transfer and the details are shown on your screen. Please do remember to put um, a reference of T and O so that we can identify the funds accordingly. The second way is that you can set aside this money in an envelope and when we go back to meeting in person, you can bring it with you and drop it in the offering bag. So as you prepare your offering, do allow me to read from a portion of scripture. Proverbs chapter 3 verses 9 to 10 says, Honour the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, for all that you have given us, Lord. We thank you that, you know, everything that we have comes from you. And today, even as we give back to you, Lord, this portion of what you have given to us, we pray that it will be used to do your good works, God, for the advancement of your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So church, today I have two announcements for you. The first one is that we are having prayer service this Tuesday. Um, a lot of the homes will be gathering um, to pray together, to lift up you know, different situations, different needs to God. Um, but even if you cannot join them, I still encourage you to take some time out and continue to pray. Um, especially for the current pandemic situation. Our second announcement is that we have set up a prayer and testimony link. We want to remind you, you know, that in this time, even though we are physically um, isolated, although we cannot meet each other in person, that you are not alone. Um, we, you know, as a church, we still want to be able to pray for you, pray together with you, and even, you know, celebrate God's goodness in your lives. So, you know, anytime throughout the week, if you have any prayer requests, any testimonies, to share them through that link and so we can continue to keep you in prayer. Here at X Church, we love celebrating birthdays. So if you are having your birthday anytime from today all the way to Saturday, we would like to wish you a very happy birthday. May this year be your best year yet. Okay, we're going to take the next few moments to pray for the pandemic that's, uh, that the world's going through right now. We want to declare God's peace and God's hope across the world. We also want to declare that God is in control of the situation. Let's pray. Thank you God for today. Thank you that you are Jehovah Rapha, our healer. We want to pray for your healing to sweep across this uh, planet, Lord. We want to pray that you will pour out your blessings upon people that have been affected so severely, Lord. We want to pray that uh, you grant people peace of mind. We pray that the families that are affected will be able to uh, find rest in you, find 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 comfort in you, Lord. We pray that uh, the people that are on the front lines still out there working in the midst of this situation will find uh, health in you a lot, will be able to be safe a lot, will be able to to be comforted when they reach home a lot, knowing that they are safe and sound a lot. We thank you for all the healthcare workers, all the logistics people, all the postmen, all the mailmen, everybody that is currently still working to keep our lives going a lot. We thank you for their sacrifice a lot. We pray that you will bless each and every one of them a lot. And we also pray that this situation will end a lot. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We have a very special speaker this morning. She is none other than our ex Edinburgh coordinator, Dr. Rachel George. But before we hear from her, we are going to hear a short encouragement from one of our ex church partners. So please join me in welcoming Sam. Good morning, church. Welcome again to our online service. Uh, if you're wherever you are, uh, thank you for tuning in, and I hope you've been blessed so far. You know, before I pass the time to Rachel uh, for her message for today, I just want to take this opportunity to share what God has done in my life. Uh, and if you're watching this and you're not a believer, I want to take this time to share how good God has been to me and how you can experience this as well. 
you know friends we, we are in this time of lockdown and i know that uh, there can be uncertainties or there can be worries or doubts or concerns that may overwhelm uh, our minds um, and for example you may be wondering when will this lockdown end man i also had this question as well when will this lockdown end or uh, you may be working uh, and you're on furlough and you may be wondering whether you can still get a get a pay, uh, get your salary from your company to support yourself or your families. Or if you're a final year student, uh, I know that a lot of companies are uh, cancelling their internships, their placements, their job offers for this year. And uh, you may feel uh, worried uh, whether you can still get a job uh, this year. And I just want to let you know, even though you may find yourself in this time where um, it may look hopeless to you you may feel hopeless but i want to let you know that there's a person that you can put your trust and you can put your hope in and that person is jesus amen uh, i want to share uh, a short testimony of what god has done for me in my final year last year um, last year during my final year it was time for me to apply for jobs uh, and i have friends who started applying for jobs and they've gotten job offers after job offers and i didn't get any uh, I, I tried applying um, uh, I tried various applications, I've given various applications, but I kept getting rejected and rejected. So, you know, it, it's tough to see your friends uh, getting jobs and uh, you not getting any. But during that time, God reminded me that I can still put my trust in Him. He is a good God. He promised that He's a good God. He's a faithful God and He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. He has the best in store for me. And, and be, I, I took that reminder. I kept trusting in God. And true enough, God blessed me with a job uh, as a research assistant. Uh, in my university for uh, for an industrial research uh, industri funded industrial research project it was actually offered by my supervisors by my my final year project supervisors and I really thank God for his favor um, I, I do get asked why uh, I don't look like I'm stressed out when it comes to exams or uh, job applications and it, it's not because of how good I am. It's not because of how skillful I am. It's not because of how many career connect events I've been to. In fact, I've been to none. In my four years in my uni, I've been to none. No career events except for a few fairs, uh, career fairs. But uh, really everything is provi was provided by God and I really thank Him for that. And the reason why I'm sharing this is because I just want to let you know, no matter what you're going through, uh, you can also put your trust in Him as well. Uh, you can put your trust in God. And uh, the first step that you can do, if you're not a believer, the first step of trust and faith that you can do is to give your life to Jesus. Put your trust in Him. You know, friends, God loves you and I so much. God loves us so much that He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. Uh, no matter how sinful we've been, no matter how broken our past uh, is, no matter how uh, 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 imperfect we are, God still loves us so much that Jesus would die for us so that we can have a loving relationship with God. Um, you know, Jesus said, said in the Bible in John chapter 10 verse 10, uh, He says that I've come to give life and life more abundantly. In another translation, it means I've come to give life and life to the full. So what does it mean by a full life? A full life means uh, a life filled with victory. God promises us a life with victory, a life filled with hope and a future, a life filled with uh, peace and, and, and joy in Him. Uh, and most importantly, a life where we can spend all of eternity with God, our Father. And I want to let you know that this invitation is for you as well. Uh, no matter what you're going Going through just call upon him um, and you can put your trust in him because our God is a good shepherd Jesus is the good shepherd who will lay down his life for his sheep amen I hope you have been blessed by this message if uh, if you've been wondering what can you do to give your life to Jesus and all you can do is just to believe admit and believe that Christ has died for your sins and call upon his name invite him into your life Amen. Uh, we've prepared a prayer at the end of the service that you can pray with to uh, give your life to Jesus. Um, and if you decided to do that today, why not, let, why not you let us know as well. Uh, let us know. Drop us an email on our website or uh, give us a DM. Uh, drop us a DM on Instagram or Facebook so that we can celebrate with you and we can also give you some materials to get you started with your amazing journey with God. Or if you have any questions, uh, just let us know as well so that we can dialogue with you and answer some of the questions that you may have. Amen. Amen. I hope you've been blessed by this message and without further ado, I'll pass the time now to Rachel for her message for today. Take it away, Rachel.
Hi Church, happy Sunday. Thank you for being here with us. My name is Rachel and I'm one of the leaders of Acts UK. If you don't know me, I coordinate our plan up here in Acts Edinburgh. So we're sending you a lot of Scottish love. Gareth said last week that the weather down in England is really nice. It is very, very not sunny here in Edinburgh. So please enjoy the weather for us. We hope you're keeping well and we send the team here in Edinburgh, send all our love to you. Um, and you know, after this is all over, please come up, please come and visit us. We would love to have you and host you. Um, but yeah, we're sending you all our love. Hope you're well. I also wanted to take this moment to just honour a few people. You know, um, this past eight, nine weeks maybe, we've been doing online service. And now that I'm recording a part, I just get a little bit more of a glimpse into how difficult it actually is and how much work goes into it. So I wanted to take this moment to honour a few people. I know you might not be able to see them, but if you know you have it in the chat box, just send them your love and send them your gratitude, really. And I just wanted to say, Pastor Dave, Pastor Kat, Tiong, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your friendship in my life. And I appreciate all three of you so much. Thank you for all that you do. And I know that you're giving your all to this church um, and to this community, even in this difficult time. We wanted to honour you for serving week in and week out. I also wanted to honour those who have been chairing and worship leading, and I'm sure I'll miss out so many t names, but Sam, Jillian, Noel, uh, Rora, Toby, Gareth, Wingman, all of you who've been chairing, thank you for everything that you do. I uh, really honour you and appreciate you, and we love you as a church, thank you. And Henry, thank you for putting this video together every single week, dealing with all our uploads, we appreciate you too. And everyone who behind the scenes have been supporting the church in this time, thank you. We love you and we appreciate you, and I just wanted to take a moment to honor you in this time. Um, but yeah, if you're ready for the word today, I hope you're excited. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 7. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She is a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thought, Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both. Cancelling their debts, who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he cancelled the larger them. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love, but a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, Your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, Who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Church, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the beauty and the richness of your word. And God, in this moment, God, I pray, may you hide me behind your cross as I speak. God, today may be a Tuesday and the word, we might only be watching this on a Sunday. But God, we thank you that your word remains true. Your word remains powerful and your word remains, oh God, in our hearts and in our spirits today. Lord, I pray, oh God, as I speak, may you, uh, may you lead every word I say and may it be of you and from you alone. Lord, I pray as people listen today, God, may our hearts be softened and open to your word, O oh God. And I pray for just an encounter with you today. And I thank you for these things, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this story that we uh, we read in Luke uh, would sound very, very familiar and very similar to you, uh, to all of you, from stories in different portions of scripture, from Mark, Matthew, and in John. I don't know why I jumped in random... Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all have kind of the similar story. But if you look a little bit closer, the story in Matthew, Mark, and John is actually a little bit different from the story in Luke. It, on the surface, it seems exactly the same. A woman brings an alabaster jar to Jesus. 
uses it, breaks it at Jesus' feet, washes his feet, and she is at the home of many other men having dinner, and they all comment on her action in one way or another. But the story in Matthew, Mark, and John actually is about Mary, who is Martha and Lazarus' um, sister, and she brings her alabaster jar of perfume, and she breaks it at Jesus' feet, and the people around them in, in those that story, in Matthew, Mark, and John, um, are actually the disciples. And in one passage, Judas is also mentioned. And what they say is like, hey, you could have sold um, that expensive jar of perfume um, and you could have given the money to the poor, <laughs> which is a whole other sermon in itself. Um, but that story is actually different from this one in Luke. This one in Luke, the woman is unnamed. We don't know who she is. They're both in a man called Simon's house, but this in this story in Luke, the, it's Simon the Pharisee. And in that story, in the other three Gospels, it's Simon the leper. So it's two... And Simon's a very common name. Simon is like the, uh, the Smith of today. <laughs> so it's Smith the leper and Smith the Pharisee. It's two different people. And lepers and Pharisees don't go in the same sentence in those days. Um... And so it's two actually two different stories. And we're going to look at the one in Luke today that is about the unnamed woman who all we know about her is that she's called sinful. Um, and, and the setting is in Simon the Pharisee's house. Now, how we're going to look at this is that we're going to look at the three different characters. And I'm going to take you through the story. So I need you to um, tap in with me, use your imagination, imagine the story. And at the end, I'll ask you a few questions um, that will really be uh, my point for today, really. Um, so if you're taking notes, just feel free to be creative. Um, draw arrows, draw a mind map. Uh, that's how I think in my head. Um, so <laughs> you might be able to follow me. <laughs> but let's start with character number one. So there are three characters, and the first person we're going to look at today, uh, look at now, is Simon. So Simon the Pharisee. In this story, you see that Simon invites um, Jesus to his home. Now, it's interesting to think why a Pharisee would invite, invite Jesus to his home. Um, and at this point, Jesus, um, you know, his ministry is just beginning in the book of Luke. He, people are starting to hear, oh, this could be the Messiah. But to the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders of that time, the, the, they, they were skeptical about this man. They were skeptical about, like, who is this Jesus? And, you know, Simon was probably asking um, um, himself and 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 his friends would have been really wanting to check Jesus out, for lack of a better word. Um, was this man really a prophet? Was his message to be believed? How did his message compare with that of the Pharisees? Were they on the same page? Was he an ally or was he an enemy? Should we stone him to death or should we keep him on our side? Um, should we resist his teaching or should we, you know, go with it? What? Uh, who is this man um, and why is he causing such a stir up? And really, probably that's the reason why Simon the Pharisee invited Jesus to his home. It was probably to just check the dude out, really. Um, <laughs> and so he invites Jesus into his home. And then we hear the story about the woman. And, and then Jesus... Um, and, and then Simon kind of questioned... In, he, if you notice, Simon doesn't even say the things that he was thinking out loud. He just thinks it. He, he thinks to himself, Wow. If Jesus knew who this woman was, if Jesus knew that this, if Jesus was a prophet, he would know that this woman is a sinner. And if this, if Jesus knew this woman was a sinner, this man would not let this sinner touch him. And Simon basically, in that moment, it doesn't explicitly say that, but he was coming to a conclusion that Jesus wasn't a prophet. Jesus shouldn't be believed because he, how can he not even know that this sinner of a woman is touching him? And so Simon has two um, premises, and in his head, his premise number one is that if Jesus was a prophet, 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 <laughs> can you tell? <laughs> I'm nervous. If Jesus were a prophet, he would know people's character. And premise number two is this, if Jesus knew this woman was a sinner, he would have nothing to do with her. And his conclusion was, since Jesus has, since Jesus has accepted this woman, he clearly does not know this woman's character. Since Jesus does not know this woman's character, he clearly isn't a prophet. And since Jesus now, in Simon's head, is not a prophet, we can reject him. And, you know, if any of you do coding, not that I do coding, but I'm assuming <laughs> that your output is just as good as your input. I guess an Excel spreadsheet works that way too. 
if you're if you put in something and that's what your thought which is with simon's premise he was like if you knew if you were a prophet you would know this woman was sinful if this woman was sinful you would reject her if that is your input then your output and your conclusion would be what simon was coming to you're not a prophet jesus is not a prophet and for si simon couldn't grasp couldn't understand that someone righteous a prophet could react to a sinful woman to a sinner with love and with grace and by accepting and not turning away because in those days if you were a religious leader there was no such thing as accepting someone who was sinful you didn't bring them close you didn't bring close near the unrighteous you shoved push them away you shun them away but Jesus was doing the complete opposite and as we read through you just see Jesus I love Jesus for many reasons but one reason is because he's so sassy sometimes and I really 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 like it um <laughs> and he instead of saying you know as always instead of directly saying it to Simon like hey I know what you're thinking he asked Simon a question he said hey Simon I'm gonna ask you a question if someone had a debt to a person and person A owes 500 silvers and person B owes 50 silvers and if I they both didn't have enough money they couldn't afford to pay it back for themselves the person forgave them both who do you suppose loves more who do you suppose is more appreciative essentially is what Jesus is saying and Simon says well I suppose the one who's been forgiven more i.e the 500 silvers um that person will be more appreciative. That person will be more loving. And then Jesus says, exactly. <laughs> and then Jesus says this. Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't even offer me water to wash the dust from my feet. But she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss. You didn't give me the courtesy to anoint me with olive oil. But look at this woman. She did all these things for me. I tell you her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me so much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows little. And what Jesus is saying to Simon's thoughts there is this. First of all, I am a prophet. I know your thought even before you said them out loud. And the second thing he proved is, Simon, I didn't accept this woman not because... I didn't know she was a sinner. I knew she was a sinner. Jesus explicitly says to Simon, um, I tell you, her sins have been forgiven even though they are many. He, he highlights to Simon, hey, I know her sins are many, but I have forgiven her. I have forgiven her sin. And because of that, she has shown me so much love because she knows how much she has been forgiven. And Jesus instantly with that sentence, as always, proves um, the, 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 the Simon's conclusion wrong. He proves Simon, hey, I am a prophet. I know your thoughts and I know her thoughts. It's just that I don't, three, I don't treat the unrighteous the way you do. I bring in my perception of righteousness is different from yours. My, percep my, my perception of people is different from yours. I don't push them away. My response to a sinner coming to me is to bring them closer. And this was a radical thought in that time. To us, it might be like, oh yeah, Jesus, you're always like that. But this, that, that was a radical thought in that time for you to accept a sinner was so, so, so counterculture in that time. And that's, you know, one of those things I love about Jesus. And so we see that Simon was challenged. Simon probably invited Jesus into his uh, into the home, um, not to not to really get to know Jesus more or anything, but probably to like check him out, make sure we are friends or whether we try to kill you, which we all know what they did. But Jesus spoke right to the heart of the issue. But something else that's very interesting that comes up here is what Jesus says in that analogy. Now, now stick with me for a little bit um, as I go through this. But Jesus says this, you know, look at the... Um, if I give you two people and I forgive this person 500 silvers, the other 50 silvers... And they both can't pay it back themselves. And I uh, forgave, or the person forgave them who, who would love more. And as we know, the answer is probably the person who's been forgiven more. A few weeks ago, a few months ago, sorry, I listened to this sermon from someone who was, um, you know, going through the book of Romans. 
And in Romans chapter 1, I think, there is a list in the middle somewhere of loads of sins, okay? And just all the bad stuff you could possibly think of. And this person who was preaching said this, they said, you know, I find it really hard to teach from the book of Romans because, or this chapter, because it comes to this section of scripture and it's so tempting as a speaker, as a teacher to skip that part because what do you say? And many Christians already, you know, you already think you're forgiven. You not think, you are forgiven from those things. So why talk about the ugly, bad stuff? Why talk about a list of sins? Why do we need to look that if look at that if we've already been forgiven? And then he said, you know what, guys, I was challenged this time to not just skip over this portion of scripture, because truly this list of sin, this list of bad stuff, even as believers, is actually a precious reminder of what we've truly been saved from. And for the past eight months, I have not been able to get that thought out of my mind. And just take a moment to take that in. It is a precious reminder of how much we have truly been saved from. You know, in this scripture, in this in this portion of scripture, Jesus, the question is, oh, if one person owes 500 silver and the other owes 50 silver, and if they both can't afford it to, to, to pay it back, and I pay it back for them, who loves more? The thing about, so obviously, <laughs> obviously the, the comparison that Jesus is drawing is 500 sins and 50 sins. They both can't pay it back because they can't pay back for their own sins. And I took it for them. I paid off their sins. Who is more appreciative? Now think about this. Both these people, a financial value, you know, 550 silvers, we can tell the difference, right? But my sin and your sin, how do you know whether my sin is 500 or your sin is 50? You, do you know what I mean? Um... Let me, let me see whether I can rephrase this. Um, me and Cat, Pastor Cat. Okay. If <laughs> Pastor Cat sin is... <laughs> do you want the 50 or 500, Pastor Cat? Let me think. Um, you get the 50 because you're nicer than me. <laughs> so let's say Pastor Cat sin is 50 silver. Let's say. And my sin is 500 silver. Pastor Cat and I will never know that hers is 50 and mine is 500, right? It is my perception of my sin. I think, if I think my sin is 500 silver, and if I view it that way, and then I come to Christ, and I understand how much I have truly been forgiven from, how much God actually did for me, then I would love so much, right? Jesus' analogy was to show that someone who under I think Jesus' analogy was to show that someone who understands how much they have truly been saved from. If you understand how much you've been truly saved from, you love and you love more. Both Simon the Pharisee and the unnamed woman in this story who is just known as a sinful woman, both of them are sinners in God's eyes. Both, none of them are perfect. But this woman, although maybe her sins may feel bigger, whatever they were, we don't know what sin she did or what sin she had. But she, I think she understood how much, how she understood one, how far away from God she actually truly was, how sinful she actually truly was. And because of that, she understood how much she had truly been saved from. And to me, that's a mind-boggling thought. You know, I was raised in the Christian family. And, you know, when I was younger, my faith was so simple because I truly believe it's because my father um, made it simple in the sense that it was very easy for me to believe that there was a heavenly father who loved me because I had an earthly father who who was a glimpse of that an earthly father who loved me so so much and i genuinely believe that is the reason starting out my faith was simple and i know not many people have that privilege and have that luxury but because of that i was also one of those people who took <laughs> sin and took 
God really for granted because I knew whatever I did wrong, my father would love me and I would never, ever, ever be thrown away. Never, ever been pushed away. Never. And it's not like my father didn't discipline me. Yeah, he did. But I also knew that that love was always there. And I feel like as I grew older, I lost touch of how much I actually have been saved from. Especially if you've been a Christian for your most of your life. I always tell people I basically was Christian coming out of the womb. I was just like, hi! <laughs> and I, I, I just remember from like the youngest age, I can remember myself, I was praying and I was in church. No idea what happened in between. Um, and it was just because it was so simple to believe there was a God who loved me. Because of that, I took it for granted. But I want to challenge you to think about it. For those of you maybe who have been believers for a long time, or you don't even have to be, maybe you've just been taking for granted how much God, you, God has truly saved you from, how much Jesus' death in Calvary has truly actually saved you from. Maybe it's time to reflect on that and remember that because, as Jesus said in this passage, when you remember that, you, you love more. And I think if you look at this passage properly, when Jesus mentions she has shown me more love, look at the comparison between Simon and this woman. Jesus doesn't say, Ma uh, not Mary, this woman, Jesus doesn't say this woman loved the world more because she's been forgiven more. Jesus doesn't say, Simon, you love the world less because you've been forgiven less. It's not love to other people per se. And it could be, it could be love to other people. But in this passage, Jesus directly highlights this, your love to me. This woman understood how much she was actually saved from. And because of that, she showed me so much love. And then Jesus compares it to Simon, who didn't even give him a kiss, didn't give him water to wash his feet, didn't anoint him with olive oil as culture. And then Jesus says, those who are forgiven little, love little. And Jesus' forgiveness doesn't change between you and you and Pastor Cat and I. It doesn't change that way. It's, I think, it's our perception of how much we've actually been saved from. So that's my first challenge to you, to think about that. Just think about when's the last time you reflected on actually how much Jesus has actually done for you in terms of saving your soul and have given you eternal life and cancel out all this list of sins that we read. It's just a reminder of how much he has actually saved us from. And maybe that will change the way we love. You know, in those days, Reading this passage, um, a, an author writes this. In those days, the reader is inclined to see in the story one sharp contrast, that which is so evident between Simon and Jesus. Here are two religious leaders suddenly in the presence of a sinful woman. One has an understanding of righteousness that causes him to distance himself from her. The other understands righteousness to mean moving toward her with forgiveness and a blessing of peace. However, the contrast Luke has in mind is actually between Simon and the woman in response to Jesus. The irony here is that even though Jesus is a guest in Simon's house, it is a sinner who extends hospitality. You gave me no water to wash my feet, Simon, and no kiss of welcome. And here she is doing all of this and far, far more because she understood how much she was forgiven. And because of that, she loved the Saviour more. So that was us looking at Simon. Now let's look at this woman. This woman, on the other hand, <laughs> is a character whose name we do not know. And all we know is that she's called a sinful woman. Now, as I said, we don't know what her sin is. It doesn't say anywhere. Many people believe and insinuate to the fact that her sin was that, that she was a prostitute. But whatever her sin was, whether it was a prostitute or not, Everybody else knew uh, that she was a sinful woman. And she knew that as well. And in the beginning of the story, we see this. We see her finding out somewhere, somehow, that Jesus was going to have a meal in Simon's house, the Pharisee's house. And she would have known full well that this dinner would have been full of men and Pharisees and religious leaders that would scorn and mock and shame her for her sinfulness because society knew about her sin. She would have known full well that this room would be filled of those type of people. Yet there was something about Jesus being there or Jesus going to eat there that 
made her want to go. And at this time, you know, G- news about Jesus was very early on in his ministry and there was kind of stories going on everywhere that he was the Messiah, some miracles here and there. And this woman somehow knew, somehow knew that Jesus was pretty much a celebrity, I guess. Um, and, and you see the heart of it, you know, it's not, she didn't have the same heart as Simon, in my opinion, because she went, it, she brought that alabaster jar of expensive perfume with her to Simon's house. She prepared herself. She was bringing a precious offering to this place this woman probably was like you know what jesus is this celebrity but she obviously knew that there was something precious about this jesus this savior this messiah that people were all talking about and so she went to the house and you know if you read through the story you pick up that this woman was actually there early because she it says jesus said that since the moment i've come in you've not even given me um water to wash my feet but this woman has been washing my feet and wiping my tears from the moment I came in and in order to be able to do that the woman must have been there early must have been there early waiting for Jesus to come so I asked my flatmate this I asked her why why did this woman go and see Jesus I don't get it she just brings an alabaster jar and she doesn't ask anything she doesn't say anything why why go see Jesus and my flatmate was kind of like what are you talking about, Rachel? Do you actually need a church plant? What's wrong with you? Um, and and she was trying to she was trying to tell me, dude, it's Jesus. Like she went to see Jesus. What 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 is so hard to understand? And what I what really made me reflect and made me think is this. You know, if you're going to a concert, you get something, right? Because the person sings, you're receiving something in a sense. This woman when heard about Jesus coming. And she went to see Jesus just because he was Jesus. Now let that sink in for a moment. She went without the intention to ask him of anything. She went without the without like you know the responsibility of like needing to serve. It's not like she was hired to serve at the place. She went because it was Jesus, full stop. She probably didn't even think she was gonna get close. Maybe she thought she could just give him the oil and then leave. Maybe. I don't know. And if you don't get, if you haven't clicked yet, what I'm insinuating to is this. No, it makes me, makes me wonder, makes me think about how we worship God. When we go to church on Sunday, and I'm not saying that worship is only church on Sunday, just an example. When we go to church on Sunday, how many times do we, one, bring our very best bring whatever is precious to us to his presence, the alabaster jar. Do we go early? Or do we come in late? And the reason we go, do we just go just because it's Jesus? And I'm not saying it's wrong to go asking. I'm not saying it's wrong to go desiring. Not that. But think about your... It makes me think about my perception of Jesus. Do I go just because I need to serve? Do I go because I coordinate the plant? Do I go because it is blessing I desire? Do I go because it's forgiveness I desire? Or do I go just because I serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, just because I serve the living God, just because I serve, and uh, just because He's the Messiah? And this woman's simplicity, her preciousness really, of going with her best, most precious alabaster jar, going early and going with no other intention but just to see the Messiah because he is the Messiah. It makes me really think about how I worship God, how we worship God. And you know, the other thing, the the alabaster jar, it might look just like a a thing that she spent money on, right? It might just, it says a beautiful alabaster jar that's filled with expensive perfume. And if you read the portion of scriptures in Matthew, Mark and John about Mary using the alabaster jar, it explains really in the footnotes of how expensive the alabaster jar actually is and how expensive the perfume is and how much it must have actually cost. And that's already mind-blowing in itself. But the other thing that the woman brought willingly was this. She was willing to lay down her pride, her ego at Jesus' feet. She was willing to lay down her money and things that were precious to her. But similarly, she knew, she knew 
that she was going yeah she knew that she was going to a place that everyone knew she was sinful and that she was going to this place to be ridiculed, and she would be ridiculed, mocked, scorned, and shamed. She knew that. Yet she went anyway. And that just, she, her alabaster jar was more than just that perfume. The alabaster jar is a symbol of what is precious to you. And what was precious to her, her ego, her pride, her character, her identity, her money, her resources, her perfume, everything. She was willing to lay that at Jesus' feet. And that was the purity of what she brought for worship, what she brought to see. Just see! Not ask. If she was asking for something, it might have been worth it in my head, like, you know, in, the, in, in this day and age. But she was willing to give up all those things just to see, just a glimpse of the Messiah. She was willing to give that give that up and that really makes me think of how I view God how I view Jesus whether I would give up everything to just see him not even receive just see him and the third character in the story that I want to highlight which has been interspersed throughout I'm sure you know is Jesus and we've seen so many aspects of Jesus at, at the moment the fact that he doesn't push the unrighteous away but brings them in the fact that he is he is the messiah he's the one who saves us from our sins and yeah just his kindness and love to this woman but towards the end we see this he says all these things to simon and the woman and he turns around to the woman and says Oh, well, to Simon and says, I tell you, though her sins are many, her sins have been forgiven. And then he says, go, your faith, go in peace, your faith has saved you. And what I love about Jesus is this. You know, you might go into his presence, maybe unable to say anything. Maybe you're like this woman who, when you go into Jesus' presence, all that you feel like doing is crying because maybe it feels like you are super sinful. Maybe it feels like you're lost. Maybe it feels like the weight of the world is on your shoulders. And it's not wrong to feel that way. And sometimes, you know, you condemn, we condemn ourselves because we enter Jesus' presence and we can't even worship. We can't even open our mouth. We just stand there and we cry. And I, I remember how that feels like. I know what that feels like. And I'm sure many of you do too. But the, the, the thing about Jesus is this. He knows exactly what you needed. Maybe this woman didn't even know that what she needed was forgiveness. Maybe she thought she was beyond hope. But Jesus looks at her and directly speaks to what she actually needs. Forgiveness. Save. She needed a saviour. And she needed that peace to go. And Jesus gave her that without her even asking. Just, just because she showed up. That is the God that we serve. And you know, to tie it all up, I was thinking of a story I could tell you guys. Um, and you know, many of you know that I recently graduated. Praise God. Thank you for all the love, church. <laughs> I really appreciate it. And this five years has been one that has been challenging for me for many different reasons. Um, and one of them being, you know, I was just reflecting and God, my God and my flatmate really... <laughs> Ask me this, what is your alabaster jar? What was, what was precious to me that I gave? And I will admit right up from the front that I'm not like this woman. I didn't willingly be like, God, take my alabaster jar. Um, <laughs> it kind of got taken away from me. <laughs> um, I guess I learned the hard way. But, but anyway, my alabaster jar, what was precious to me, what has been precious to me for a very long time is my identity. And... Coming to university in Edinburgh, I <laughs> don't want to sound arrogant, but I was a very high accomplished, highly accomplished 19 year old um, <laughs> with a lot of awards and accolades. I uh, was top of my class for years. 
um, I was an athlete. I ran my own club, my own sports club. I trained them, I coached them, I competed. Um, and, you know, I even though I was raised a believer and would very easily tell everyone my identity is in the Lord, like, you know, I went to church, I serve, you know, praise God, my identity is in Him. I would be able to tell you all those things. But you never truly understand that until what is precious is taken away from you. And, you know, when, when, when first year started, you know, things were okay. You know, I was still living my identity, you know, being like, tr well, trying to. Uh, I was just living off the past identity. And not many people know this, but the same week I was asked whether I wanted to lead church the year after um, the, the pioneer left. Um, the same week I got asked um, by the Great Britain women's team um, of the sport I play whether I wanted to play for the national squad and instantly training would begin in London every two weeks. Um, training here locally would be every Sunday. Um, I would be off flying, playing tournaments in dream places um, in Finland, in Sweden. Uh, you know, it was, it was an offer that I wanted to take if I could. I thought it would look great on my CV. And I wasn't going to be an athlete anyway, but who doesn't want to play for Great Britain? Like... Um, but thank God for my gung-ho 19-year-old Steph was like, you know what, church is the most important thing in the world. Like, I'm going to say yes. And I took on church and obviously because of that, gave up this spot in the women's team. And I didn't realize what it took away from me. Um, I thank God now. But in the process, I lost my identity as an athlete. I lost my identity as um, someone who was very involved in sports. And that, that was fine. That was one aspect. Along the way, because of my own lack of discipline, I struggled academically. And there was a few times there uh, throughout my five years that I nearly failed my exams. And a few years ago, I, would, I was so prideful, and I was so egoistic that I would never tell you that I nearly failed something. Never in a million years that was like unheard of. Um, failure was not in my dictionary. Um, but because of everything God has done with me, I can tell you the truth that there was a few times there that I nearly failed. Um, and it was not because God was punishing me or anything. Well, I hope not. Um, <laughs> it was my lack of discipline and inability to juggle things be just because of myself, really. I didn't know how to say no to certain things and stuff like that. So that was that that part of being, you know, a top student was taken away from me. And because of the, the saying, because I said yes to church and because I was in medical school, my time became a limited resource um, and I couldn't do anything much of anything else outside of church, really, because it was I had growing responsibilities and things like that. And because of that, I, I felt like I lost another part of myself. I used to do so many things extracurricularly, had a beautiful CV, it was shining, it was glowing. And then suddenly I felt like everyone else around me was doing so many things and I just couldn't afford to. I just didn't have the time. And that part of my identity was taken away. Along the way, a lot of other things happened, relationships broke down, you know, I struggled with different things and it just kept feeling that God was taking away what was precious to me, my identity. So much so that I realise now looking back that I would hold on to my identity so much, I would talk about it so much because I wanted it to still define me because I was a different person today. And only recently did I realise that that was what was precious to me. My identity was what made me me. And I thank God that now after having all those things taken away because I chose to serve him, because I chose to worship him. Unlike that woman, I didn't bring my alabaster jar willingly. <laughs> but now that I, I look back and I see that, you know, saying yes to church, saying yes to his calling allowed me to bring, in one way or another, my alabaster jar to him. I realized breaking it at his feet was so worth it. I can't say I'm completely better today or whatever, but a little bit more of me understands that the things of this world fade away. My successes of this world fade away. But my relationship with God, serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, bringing everything I have. It, it's, not about, it's not about doing just church things, you know. If God's calling away your life for something else, you know, I'm not asking you to give up everything. If your calling was to be an athlete, don't give up like that space position um, to, you know, uh, I don't know, run a plant, <laughs> like, unless God calls you to, of course. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying 
give it up i didn't give up medical school to do church full-time you know it was still part of my calling but yeah i didn't realize how much giving up what was precious to me would would mean and you know i was learning all those things and you know my time in Edinburgh has been precious um my church family is everything i live for essentially um um and you know i i started to feel like you know god wow i gave you my all god um <laughs> you better reward me at some time <laughs> i don't think that way that's not good um and you know this year <laughs> as i was getting a bit more of a hold of myself um i found out some really hard news when i came back for my final year of medicine um and it's just a testimony i wanted to share with you guys just to encourage you um, but when I came back to, uh, to to the UK for my final year of medicine, uh, my family found out that my uncle, who was very close to me, my family is like really, really tight, like it's really weird, but we were very, very close. Um, and my uncle, who is very, very, very close to my family, to me, um, was diagnosed with end-stage cancer. And it was extra painful because I was actually back home for summer. Um, and he was telling me about the symptoms and I didn't click. And when you're a doctor yourself, you just expect it to click, um, but it didn't. And it was so banned or obvious. It was so obvious what it was. I was just gutted, um, <laughs> to say the least. And I was supposed to go to Africa for my elective this year. I, was, I planned it all. I raised money for Africa. You know, I was ready to go. I changed it, swapped everything, changed all the money, directed it back to Malaysia um, and was like, yeah, you know what? I'm going to... Go back for me it felt like you know god i've given you everything i've given you my identity it felt like you know when you wash a cloth and then you like squeeze it and god was just like squeezing the last ounce of me and the last thing that was precious to me was my family and it just felt like god was even taking that away i'm like god you take away my awards you take away my spots like leave me alone for once but god was like it felt like god was taking that away from me and so I became a bit like this woman. I, I, I feel like I relate to her because I can't remember over the past year ever praying for my uncle, praying for myself. It sounds terrible. And thank God for church members and families and partners who walked alongside me and my family. But I couldn't. I just felt um, paralyzed in my prayer life. I just felt unable to ask anything. And maybe to a certain extent, I felt like I didn't deserve it. Maybe to a certain extent, I felt like there was nothing asking for. There's no hope and i would just go to jesus's presence a little bit like this woman just not saying anything really just being like i mean i'll pray for church and stuff but nothing for myself and my life and my family and my uncle and like one day before my final exam this this year in february I, you know in the back of my mind i was like all of this will be worth it when you get to go back and see your uncle and you know spend time with him before things get worse and maybe i don't have the chance to see him again and things like that and the day before my final exam, <laughs> because of COVID, my flight to Malaysia got cancelled and my plans to Malaysia got cancelled. And I actually, kid you not, sat in front of the computer in the library and bawled my eyes out like a crazy psychopath. I was just like crying and crying. I was like, God, why would you do this to me? I've given my life to you. I've given everything to you. Can't I just go back and see my uncle who is like gonna die because he's unwell? Like, what's wrong with you? And I was just like, God, why would you do this to me? And, you know, I was telling everybody, I'm so excited to go back to Malaysia because it's my birthday, can't wait to party, da da da. But actually, I just wanted to see him. Like, I just wanted to see him before I didn't get a chance to anymore. And it was so hard. And I remember thinking like, oh, God. And I remember being just like paralyzed in my prayer life, you know. Just, just unable to say anything. Even in this COVID-19 pandemic, if I'm honest, I'm not one of those people who went to my feet and be like, God help us. I was one of those people who's like, God, even more, I just can't pray anymore. I just can't. I don't know what to ask you. But all I tried to do was go to him and give him my best, even if my best was just silence and at his feet, weeping. Well, not wiping the tears with my hair, but, you know, just, just worshipping him, even if the worship was wordless. Just going to church, just being there, just standing there and saying, God, I'm here because you deserve it. I'm here because at the moment, this is my all. 
I can't do anything else. And a few days ago, a few weeks ago, one week ago, I got a phone call from my mom. And, you know, this is the part about God that I love. The part about God that just <sighs> reminds me every time that this faith is worth it. Um, I got a call from my mom that said my uncle went for a scan and somehow, well, miraculously, the scan came back completely clear and my uncle, who supposedly had late stage cancer, suddenly has no cancer. Um, and as a medic myself, <laughs> I, I know that that is slightly impossible, um, except when you have a God who is the God of the impossible, but a God who just shows up and knows what you need, knows what you need even before you know it. And even when you don't know what's best for you, I thought what's best for me is I just needed to go home. You know, this woman might have thought, I just need to see Jesus, you know, I don't deserve anything. And sometimes I felt that way as well. But Jesus said, hey, your sins are forgiven, your faith has saved you, go in peace. That woman might not have even known that forgiven was, forgiveness was what she needed. I didn't know that I just needed to be reminded of how much God knew me, knew my heart, watched for my family, even when it felt like it didn't. And I want to praise God and honor God for the healing of my uncle. I want to encourage all of you. You know, I had to practice a million times before I told you that there hasn't many because I was telling Pastor Cat I could have never gone through that story without crying <laughs> and I didn't want to ruin my makeup, <laughs> which sounds really childish, but. But I want to encourage you, your testimony, share it. You know, you never know who needs to hear that. And I pray that it is my practicing uh, is a blessing to at least one of you to believe for healing. But to believe that God knows what you need even before you say it. Even when you don't know what you need, God knows. And so wrapping up, I have three questions for you. And I know I've gone, taken you through a story about these three characters in this story. Simon the Pharisee and how he viewed God how he viewed Jesus, how it was about questioning him, how he couldn't understand how a, love, how a righteous God would let an unrighteous person near. We talked about Mary, who turned up, who was early, who brought her very best, who may not have known what she could say, what she, what she could do anymore because she was so sinful, maybe didn't know what she needed, but she turned up and she showed up just, just because this was the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And then we look at Jesus, who knows you, knows your heart before more than you could ever know yourself. And a God who shows up, and a God who is kind, and a God who is loving. My three questions for you as we end is this. Number one, who or what is it you worship? There's a quote that says, what you think about God is the most important thing about you. And it's a deep one. Take your time to think about it. <laughs> But more and more as I think about it, I believe it. How you, how you view God is the most important thing about you. Because if you view God like yourself, like Simon the Pharisee did, Simon the Pharisee was a man who would push the unrighteous away. And if you view God that way, you will push the unrighteous in your life away. If you feel unrighteous, you will think God pushes you away. You won't worship the real God. You will worship a God that you've created, the premises you have made up about that God. Like Simon did. Simon looked at Jesus and said, you can't be a prophet. You let a sinner near you. You don't know she's a sinner. Who or what is it you worship? Question number two is this. How do you worship? If you look at the woman, she worshipped by bringing her very best Everything that was precious to her, she brought to Jesus. The alabaster jar, the willingness to lay down her ego, her pride, to open herself up to ridicule, mock and shame. But she, yet she brought that all to Jesus. She was early. She turned up early. She gave her best. And she served and served humbly. She sat at his feet. She wiped his feet with her tears. And that's not a glorious job, wiping someone's feet, wiping someone's feet with your hair. It's not a glorious job. But she did it anyway. She didn't need to be front stage. She didn't need to be up in front. She was willing to just sit back 
wipe the feet, do the small jobs that people didn't, might not have thought mattered. But Jesus saw her. Jesus thought it mattered. Jesus knew it mattered. Jesus knew that there was honour in that woman's life. How do you worship? Not just on a Sunday, on your everyday life. How do you worship? And number three, why do you worship? Do you worship God because he gives you something? Do you come to God's presence asking or wanting something like I, I do a lot of times? You know, Sam led us in a song a few weeks ago. I'm not here for blessing. Jesus, you don't owe me anything. More than anything that you could ever do, I just want you. Is that how you view God? Is that why you worship? Do you worship God simply because he is God? Simply because he is the Messiah? Simply because he has saved you for so, from so much more than you could ever ask for or imagine? He has saved you from so, so, so much. Is that why you worship? Or do you worship because you want something from Jesus? Do you worship because you want to ask him some questions like Simon did? Or do you worship because he gives, because he forgives, because of many different things? Why do you worship? So as we end, I pray that somehow something in that long story <laughs> spoke to you. And that you think about that. Think about what or who is it you worship. Do you worship a God who... who saves you and loves you and has saved you from so much? How do you worship? Do you give God your very, very, very best? And your best in every season changes. Your all in every season changes. My all when I was 19 is different to my all today as a doctor. It, it changes. And thirdly, how do you worship? No, why do you worship? Do you worship him for blessing? Or do you come with a heart that said, God, I just want you. You are more than enough. You don't owe me anything. I just want you. Just let's pray. Father, I thank you for the word today. Father, I pray that everything that I say, God, is of you and from you. And God, as people hear, God, may it be you at the center of their hearts. Whatever it is that might have spoken to them, God, I pray May it just not co written to you, void God, but may you stir up difference and change in, in their hearts. Lord, I pray, God, for, um, for, the, for every person listening today, whatever it is you may have spoken to them. Lord, I pray that may you guide their thoughts as they think about you. May you give them an action, something that they can do and work and act on this, God. And God, may you teach us to have a heart just like this woman did. A heart that comes so simply into your presence just because you're a God who deserves it. Because you are you, we come into your presence, God. And Lord, I pray, O oh God, um, for your presence to just go with each person as we leave today. That you work in our hearts, O oh God, and make, me, make us true worshippers of you the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the God who deserves all praise and deserves all worship. We thank you for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you've been touched by today's message and would like to invite Jesus into your life, why don't you join me in saying this prayer? Lord Jesus, thank you for paying the ultimate price for my sins by dying on the cross for me. I receive your love and forgiveness and eternal life by faith. Come into my heart and life and be my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you, Rachel, for that powerful message. If you said that prayer and made the decision to make Jesus Christ your God and Savior this morning, please do contact us so that we can help you as you embark on this new, exciting journey. Now, as our service is coming to an end, will you please allow me to close in prayer? Father, we pray for your covering and care to come upon our entire church family for Pastors Kenneth and Sandra, all our elders, pastors, and church plan coordinators, both here and abroad, as well as all our leaders who serve your house faithfully week after week. Give us your daily peace and protection, and provide us all our needs according to your riches in glory, especially the wisdom to continue to be a church that is in line with your perfect will. 
Let your joy always be our strength and let our lives always bring you glory. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, um, may I please invite you to lift up your hands as I declare the benediction over you. Reading from Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you for joining us for service this Sunday. I hope to see you back here next week. May you have a good week ahead.